Hey everyone, so I want to do a hopefully relatively quick discussion video about Dante's Inferno, which I uh, reread for the third time in the, over the course of the past few weeks, and I read it in this edition, which is the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow translation with an introduction and notes by Peter Bondanella, which is an edition that I think I can wholly recommend because it also has the lovely uh, Gustave Doré illustrations, uh, if that is your fancy. So Dante's Inferno is a literary work that will certainly be familiar to most viewers of this video because it's often assigned in schools, it's one of the most famous literary works ever written, uh, and so on and so forth, and it's not really even a literary work on its own, it's actually one part of a larger work which has three parts, and that is of course the entire Divine Comedy, with the other two parts of the comedy being the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. And uh, the Inferno basically begins with uh, a, a canto, uh, it's divided into different cantos which are just little sections of poetry. Uh, the first canto ha finds Dante so feeling lost in the middle of his life at 35 years old, uh, in the middle of a dark wood in the famous opening line, and not really knowing how to attain salvation. There's sort of this mountain that appears in the first canto uh, that he can't, feels like he can't climb, and that mountain is supposedly and sort of allegorically stands in for salvation. And he's also approached by three beasts who all stand for a different kind of sin, it's not all that important. But anyway, in that first canto, uh, he's all afraid of what's going to happen to him, and then Virgil, the ancient Roman poet, uh, approaches him, and of course Dante does a whole fanboy act because Virgil was his favorite poet, and uh, there are many references to Virgil's Aeneid, his most famous work throughout the Divine Comedy, and Virgil tells him that he's been sent by Beatrice, who is a woman who the real Dante sort of had an infatuation with. It's not clear entirely what their relationship with, but he had he met her a couple of times. He didn't actually know her that well, but he was obviously infatuated enough with her to write a lot of poetry about her and to make her the sort of divine stand-in in his epic poem about his finding of salvation. And Beatrice herself died very young, and so in Dante's like universe, Beatrice died and went to heaven and is now sitting, you know, very close to like the Virgin Mary in the divine hierarchy, so she's really high up there. And she's sort of taken an interest in helping Dante to attain salvation, so she has sent da Virgil to lead him through hell, uh, who will then lead, also lead him through purgatory, and then Beatrice herself will lead him through uh, paradise. And this going through these different stages is supposed to lead Dante to salvation, in a way. So in this first canticle, as it's called, of the comedy, Virgil leads him through hell, as I'm sure many of you know. And hell is divided uh, quite nicely into nine different circles where different sins are punished, although that characterization is a little bit uh, deceptive because within certain circles of hell there are multiple levels, and so really there are more than nine different levels of hell, but still it is ostensibly divided into nine circles, and that is pictured quite nicely in this uh, illustration, which you might not be able to see that well. But there, within the nine circles there are sort of three groupings of different sins that are punished there, and they, they do get worse and worse in terms of how bad the sins are, with the very bottom of hell being this frozen wasteland where Lucifer himself is. But uh, in the upper places of hell, you have for one place, li for one thing, Limbo, which is where people who were never baptized are, and I think those people do eventually get to go to heaven, but they don't get to go to he heaven right after they die, they have to wait till the second coming, basically. Uh, but then in the lower, in the in, when you go below that, you have first the uh, sins of incontinence, which is sort of inability to resist desi desires, lust and gluttony and wrath and these sorts of things. Then you have sins of violence, uh, so like doing harm to others, so there's violence against uh, others, obviously like murder, violence against the self, which includes suicide, and then violence against God, which is sort of heresy and things like that. And then in the lowest circles you have fraud, which is sort of betrayal of of friends or those you're meant to serve, uh, and so on and so forth. And what's interesting about that conception of sin, sin is that it's not based on the seven deadly sins, which is what we might expect a writer like Dante to base his sort of conception off of because of the, the period he's from and the background he has, uh, but it's actually based more on uh, the, the Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, where which is one of his most important works, although it's not very readable, but it is one of his most important works where he discusses uh, basically how to live 
a uh, good human life, and uh, he puts forth three different classes of vices, which are uh, incontinence, uh, malice, and insane bestiality, as Peter Bondanella puts it in his introduction. And so these three different classes of sins punished in the Inferno are roughly analogous to those. Uh, and what's interesting about the Inferno, I think more than the Purgatorio or the Paradiso, is just how well it weaves together the classical and the Christian world, not only in that philosophical sense, uh, but also in the kind of mythologies of the two worlds. So like in Hell, which is obviously a Christian idea, you have the river Acheron and the river Styx, which come from the Greek and Roman underworld. Uh, he Dante at one point meets Cerberus, the dog who guarded uh, Hades. Uh, you, you have centaurs appearing as guards in one circle of hell. So you, you have this really clever, I think, mixing together of the classical and the Christian worlds, which I, I find really fun. I really nerd out at, over that as a as a fan of the classics of Greece and Rome. And in addition to uh, the Inferno as well as the entire Divine Comedy being uh, having a lot of sort of mythological figures from the classical world show up and sort of philosophical references to the classical world. It also has a lot of literary references uh, to the classical world and to the Bible. So just to put that, just to show you sort of how referential the comedy is, um, in the back of this edition, which is the uh, Alan Mandelbaum translation with his notes and uh, an introduction by Eugenio Montal, um, there is an entire section of just references, literary references that Dante makes throughout the comedy. And so, just in the first canto, you have a reference to Psalm 89, a reference to Isaiah 38, Jeremy, uh, or Jeremiah 5, chapter 5, Timothy chapter 6, Luke chapter 2, and then uh, Virgil of the Neid chapter, uh, book 3. So, references throughout it, and, and there are also a lot of historical references and a lot of people from Dante's own life who appear at one point. Some of his old friends appear, uh, a teacher of his appears, uh, and so, and there are these historical figures who make a lot of historical references that as a modern reader you m may very well not get. And so, the, co the Inferno and the com comedy as a whole is something that really needs footnotes and needs explanation, and to put that in perspective, I wanted to show you just how much of the edition of the Inferno that I read is made up of endnotes. So, this much right here is all endnotes, so, and I read all the endnotes, uh, or most of them, uh, in this read-through, and yeah, you, you really kind of need it, I think, to get what you, everything you can out of it. And so the reading experience is extremely taxing. You know, you're fl flipping back to endnotes and so and stuff like that. And in Longfellow's translation, the, the English itself is also a bit of an idiom. It's very sort of old school, romantic 19th century poetry, whereas Alan Mandelbaum's translation is much more modern and also very eloquent. So I would probably recommend the Mandelbaum translation over the Longfellow translation, although Longfellow fellow translation is still quite good, and Peter Bondanella's intro and, and notes are quite, are decent, they're serviceable, I don't think they're the best I read, but they will give you a good grounding in the history and Dante's life and what the comedy is and what it's doing, and the notes will explain everything to the degree that they need explaining for you to get what you can out of it. And so the reading experience is really taxing, but I think if you can do it, it can be just such a pleasure. Uh, I always love revisiting uh, the comedy, and in this case the Inferno, and just re-experiencing my favorite bits over and over again. Uh, my favorite passage in the Inferno is when Dante meets Ulysses in in uh, the Inferno, and Ulysses is in hell because he's a Greek and Dante didn't like Greeks because they destroyed Troy, uh, and a Trojan, Aeneas, was the one who founded Rome, and of course Dante loved Rome because he was Italian and because most of sort of Western civilization is based on the Roman Empire, but, uh, but so Ulysses is in hell, and pretty deep in hell, he's not in a good place in hell, but the passage with Ulysses has such a glorious sort of epic passage where Ulysses talks to Dante about what he did after his journey in Homer's Odyssey. Basically, Ulysses says that after he got home to Ithaca, after his journey in the Odyssey, he got bored, so he went on a whole new journey out to, you know, sail the seas and see what he could find, and he goes past the Strait of Gibraltar and out into the open sea and eventually finds a great mountain out in the middle of the ocean, and what he doesn't know is that 
that's Mount Purgatory, which is the mountain that Dante will go to in the next canticle of the of the comedy. And uh, from there, he's at, he he, and then his ship actually sinks from there because he's not allowed to go to Purgatory because he's he's damned. He's one of the damned, and also the living aren't technically supposed to go to Purgatory. But uh, this passage where he narrates that is so glorious, and it was so influential on a lot of 19th century romantic poets who saw this kind of romantic hero in Ulysses in that passage and they saw this as a kind of glorification of this man who Dante put in hell you know showing that Dante kind of does sympathize with this man in a certain degree um, and Peter ba and I see it that way too and Harold Bloom for example also sees it that way he quotes that passage at length in his chapter on the Divine Comedy in his book The Western Canon um, Bonzanella is kind of down on that view of that passage. He kind of thinks that really the way that you're supposed to see it is that Ulysses was full of pride, and so that's what led to his downfall, etc., etc. And I see that that interpretation completely, but I think it kind of misses the point in a way. And that leads to an another big struggle that I think people have with the comedy, uh, which is this idea that these people are being punished eternally. You know, I heard from certain people who read this and just think what kind of a god would do this to anyone you know especially the christian god who's supposed to be full of you know love and compassion and forgiveness and so on and so forth why would he even have a place like this where all these people are being punished gratuitously and that's something that dante struggles with as well he can't help but sympathize with various people he meets in hell you know for example paolo and francesca who he meets in the circle for lust who are these lovers who adulterous lovers who were sent to hell and uh, who are most famously commemorated in the statue uh, the kiss which i'll try to put up put up a picture of here you've probably seen it before you know he struggles with his pity for these people who are have been damned eternally and virgil tells him that he needs to get over that actually that pitying the damned is bad actually and the best way that i can put why in the universe of Dante's poem, why it's bad to sympathize with the damned is because they had every possible opportunity to save themselves. You know, literally all it would have taken it was an 11th hour confession or repentance. You know, you have that parable in the Gospel of Matthew where, you know, the people who uh, started work on this farm early on in the day uh, you know, work all day, and then these other people who come at the 11th hour and start work too, then at midnight are all given the same treatment, you know, and the people who were there since the morning are like, well, hey, we've been here since the morning, why are you, people tre why are you treating the people who were here at the 11th hour the same as us? And Jesus kind of says, well, that's how salvation works. And so literally these people could have just had an 11th hour confession and been saved but something kept them from doing it. And it's also emphasized that they, to a degree, actually love their punishment because the punishments are kind of based on the sin that the, the people were sent to hell for. So in the circle for lust, they're blown around by wind constantly, unable to control it, just like they were unable to control their, uh, their, their lust and, and stuff like that. And so the best way that I could sort of put why sympathizing with the damned is not a good thing is that you should look at every single damned person as though they're literally Sauron from the Lord of the Rings or Morgoth from the Silmarillion. They, they're literally Satan himself or just Lucifer. You know, that's how you should be looking at them. And I, 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 I struggle with that too. I don't, I don't entirely like it. Something about it feels really icky to me actually. And I'd be interested to hear like what other readers have made of that whole struggle in the in the co in the inferno in particular and then finally what's great about revisiting the inferno is finding new just images and passages that are just poetically so ingenious uh the one that really struck me uh, on this on this read happens in uh, canto 22 where he compares uh people who are basically being punished for selling offices to other people a uh, form of of fraud uh, and they're basically punished by having to be submerged below boiling pitch and if they emerge from the boiling pitch then they're attacked by these demons and what the what people in this part of hell do is they will sort of sort of uh, slyly put their backs above the boiling pitch to you know get some relief while the demons are away but then when they see the demons coming they'll sort of submerge and Dante compares that to the behavior of frogs, which I kind of liked. And uh, so here's the passage. As on the brink of water in a ditch, the frogs stand only with their muzzles out, so that they hide their feet and other bulk. So upon every side the sinners stood, 
Whatever as Barbariccia near them came, thus underneath the boiling they withdrew. And uh, yeah, it's just little, little really great poetic images like that that I return to the comedy for. Um, because it is, you know, you know, much as we can talk about all these allegorical interpretations and about sin and about salvation and these other uh, complex things, I think it behooves us to just read it as we read any poem for great imagery. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's a little ramble about the Inferno. I hope you all enjoyed. Give me your thoughts if you've read this, and I will leave it at that. Bye, guys.